I thought I had found my religion with uh, mushrooms, but I think there's another religion that matter that speaks more to me through numbers. So I'm definitely going to learn more about that next. So this is a kind of a funny place to start a talk about magic mushrooms. Uh, but I thought I should tell a real true story. And usually you kind of hear these funny origin stories about how people first got interested in psychedelics. And I thought I would just tell the honest truth. And so I used to take magic mushrooms and MDMA in the graveyard on campus at night when I was in college. And so now you know officially how strange I am that this felt more normal to me than some of the other activities you could be doing in college. I guess the other options weren't that great. <laughs> I had no idea at the time that finding this kind of peaceful sanctuary in the middle of the night in a place where death and the mysterious void is so palpable, that that would really plant the seed for the journey that I would be called to go on, you know, 18 years later. So, you know, fast forward and suddenly I find myself, I'm a mom of two kids. Uh, I've tried out my hand at academia and it, you know, it, it wasn't me, it was them. <laughs> it didn't really work out. <laughs> Um, I'm teaching people about psychedelics just as psychedelics are getting super popular, which is weird because I like always loved the fact that they weren't popular and now suddenly like the thing I love the most is popular and that's strange. And I'm guessing that a lot of you probably heard about psychedelics in the last year because of Michael Pollan. So I, you know, I'm very thankful that Michael Pollan made psychedelics so popular. And um, I also hope that that's just kind of another gateway and people can start asking more questions. Um, but the funny thing, too, about psychedelics is they're now suddenly, like, glamorous, which is another strange thing to me because none of my mushroom experiences are glamorous. <laughs> I don't know the experiences other people are having, but when I come out of the experiences, my first idea isn't how to create a million psilocybin clinics that are, like, beautifully decorated all over the world so that people can have these, like, wonderfully smooth, uh, you know, revelatory healing experiences, like my experiences with mushrooms are messy and painful and literally in the ground, and they're all about relationship. And so I guess today I'd like to share with you some of that personal journey and also some of the love stories that I've seen other people go through with mushrooms and maybe kind of take some of the glamour away and share the real world of psychedelics, at least according to me. So I came across um, this quote by Tim Leary. Tim Leary had this uh, tendency to take like ancient religious texts and then kind of adapt them to psychedelics. And so I believe this one is from Taoism. But so here it goes. There comes a time when the ecstatic cry is called for. At that time, you must be ready to pray, to go beyond yourself. When you have lost the need to pray, you are a dead man in a world of dead symbols. Pray for life, pray for life. I want today, right now, to let all of you know, and I'm sorry, this is bad news for some of you, the mystical psychedelic patriarchy is over. I know it doesn't seem like that because it still seems like a lot of the men in charge have like a really cool future for all of us, but I don't think their future is what most of us want. And with all respect to Leary, and Walter Penke, and my own mentor, Bill Richards, and all these amazing men who've come before me, I want to elevate a different story and a different voice that the mushrooms have shared with me. So that voice begins with Maria Sabina, the original mother of the mushroom. When she was a little child, she took mushrooms for the first time, growing up in this tiny village in Oaxaca, Mexico. And she called them the little children, the little saints. So to her, there was always this mother-child relationship with this healing medicine. She herself was a mother. She had many children. Uh, I believe one of her sons ended his life. She lost a husband. And in the documentary about her life, where she's kind of commenting and reflecting on the work that she's dedicated her whole life to, she says, you know, at some point, I had walked back and forth through the doorway of death so many times that I no longer was afraid of what it took to heal people. 
And so I think back to that example of a very simple, poor, uh, tiny mother and the healing that she was able to kind of unleash upon the world. And I hope that we can kind of get closer to her example rather than closer to the example that was unleashed. And, you know, she had a bit of a somber thing to say about Westerners taking psilocybin mushrooms. She said as soon as the foreigners came down, as soon as the hippies came down, as soon as these men came down and took the mushrooms, they know they stopped working and there's no remedy. I believe there's a remedy, but we have to get back to this original story. The second love story I want to share is a story that happened in the clinic setting. It's where I got my start after the whole graveyard period and learning meditation. I found my way to Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. And there were so many amazing things that happened in this room. I'm sure you've heard many of the stories. There are countless, you know, exquisitely beautiful examples of mystical experiences and redemption and healing and confronting old wounds and uh, just amazing. But this one story I want to share is about a young man who was trying to learn how to meditate and he was participating in a healthy study, a healthy volunteer study. And once we started working with him, we realized that he had debilitating social anxiety. Like he lived a completely isolated life. He had very limited interaction with a roommate. He had a job that allowed him to just kind of show up and do his job and go home. And he played a lot of video games. Um, in the prep sessions, when we're preparing people for their high dose experience, we practice touching them on the shoulder while they're laying on the couch and we practice holding their hand. And for most people, this is fairly innocuous. Some people get a little bit triggered, but we kind of work through it. He couldn't hold either of our hands for more than a few seconds. And so we kind of were like, okay, I guess we'll just support him in other ways. Well, fast forward to his session and it was actually him on his high dose when he reached out and asked to hold my assistant guide's hand. And in his uh, report the next day, he talked about reaching for the hand of Dan. <laughs> my assistant guide Dan and I were like, it was like reaching for the hand of God, you know? But in this really human sense, psilocybin helped him get over his fear of intimacy, his fear of love. And by modeling that with him in the session room, one of the outcomes was that he started being able to go on dates after being a part of the study. And that's not something you'll read in any of the reports about the spiritual outcomes and improvements in meditation. Um, but that's the real kind of human quality of mushrooms, you know, masquerading through the chemical of psilocybin. Another story, a love story, that came from my work at Hopkins was there was an elder Zen teacher who had had almost no drug experiences, maybe tiny bits of cannabis experience when she was a teenager. And she heard me speak about psychedelics and she said, you know, the way you talk about this work makes me curious, makes me want to kind of see what it's like. So she piloted one of um, our studies at Hopkins on long-term meditators. And the coolest thing about this woman was when she showed up, she said, listen, you're the expert, I'm here to learn. And I suddenly realized that I was in the presence of a great teacher. And she gave herself fully to this experience. She hated the onset. She's like, oh my God, if it's just all the colors and lights and the, all of this stuff, is this what people are talking about? This is terrible. Like, why would you want to do this all the time? And then that was just the beginning. And then we started asking her all these questions. And she's like, well, this just got a little bit worse. Now I'm having to like meditate and answer questions. <laughs> I'm like, I'll do it. But like, okay, this is, I've kind of made, my, made up my mind. And I said, you know what, let's just not do the questionnaires. You know, this is a pilot. I want to learn from you. And so we gave up the questions, and she just immersed herself in the music and the experience. And she, what stood out in my mind as I remember her, she said it felt like she was being guided on this beautiful tour through the garden of her life. And she was able to, from her perspective as an elder teacher, look back on all of the things she had experienced in her life as if you're walking through a fragrant garden. And it just really stuck with me, this like way that psilocybin can help us lovingly appreciate everything we've gone through as if we're walking through the Garden of Eden in our later days. The final love story that I wanna share a bit about is my own love story with mushrooms. Uh, when my sister died in 2013, I understood 
intimately, directly, what Rumi wrote about when he talked about the beloved. I was blown away by the power of this love, and it propelled me all the way to Nepal, where I was a witness to, a helpless witness to, a drowning, a young man drowned. And it wasn't my sister's death that broke me, it was this witnessing of this tragic drowning death. I was, from this kind of abyss of grief, mushrooms were the thing that found me and kind of started helping pull me back up to the surface. They helped me find parts of myself that I didn't know were missing from a very long time ago in my life. They helped bring first my daughter, then my son into the world. And if you want to know how that works, <laughs> it's really quite amazing. And then when I found myself in another kind of postpartum depression, I didn't know how to do anything other than go to the mushrooms and ask for help, because they had always been such good friends, such loving friends in the past. And they said, no, like, you just, just be a mom. And I was like, yeah, but I can't, it's really hard. And they're like, like kind of like, we got nothing. Like, your children are here, and now this is, this is it. You just do it. And I felt like they were really letting me down until I realized that they were pushing me in a different direction, in a loving direction, the way a parent might say, finally, like, okay, you're ready to do this on your own. You can't keep coming to me for advice. So I taught myself how to paint, and I was able to paint the visions and paint the experience that I had had. Uh, I learned all these other practices that I had no idea had anything to do with psychedelics and mushrooms. But it brought me into my life. It really healed me. And then the final miracle happened. Sometime in the spring, I still had a lot of like kind of leftover hostility and anger. And there was one particular relationship in my life that felt very unhealed, and it was with my dad. And I knew he was really sick, and the kind of the the clock was ticking. And I was getting pretty scared that, not, that this, whatever between us wasn't going to be resolved before he died. My friend at the time asked me, he said, what do you know about forgiveness? And I said, not much. And so I planted a garden. And the thing about gardens is we always want the flowers, but we don't want to dig in the dirt and the manure and have the flowers fail to, to even germinate, and we don't like when the bunny rabbits show up and eat the leaves that have just, you know, come into being. And it was this kind of desperate prayer that I put into the earth and said, please show me how to do this. I was able to paint this scene from the day this young man drowned in Nepal, six years after it happened, and two days before I brought my dad into the ER suddenly. Uh, with what turned out to be cancer that had spread to his brain and spinal fluid. The day my dad entered hospice, the first flower bloomed in that garden. The day he was cremated, the first sunflower bloomed. And I suddenly understood this impossible lesson of love and forgiveness. I don't know how else to speak about it other than to tell you it's possible and it's a fucking miracle. So I have a lot more that I could share about psychedelics. Feel free to take a picture of these words and really contemplate them. Everything that the mushrooms have given me and that I've seen them give others cannot be reduced to something that you get in a clinic. It cannot be put into a therapist's office. And it can't even really be put into a church. I think the only way that mushrooms will be able to continue their love affair with humans is through communities. And I think we can really do it together and every community is gonna figure out the best way to do it. It can't involve authority figures or experts, but everyone participating together and helping call each other in to this really impossibly amazing and hard work. There are probably some of you who have been turned on to the idea of medical clinics and FDA-approved medicine. And again, 
feel free to kind of contemplate these words more on your own, but the medical system has failed so many people and I believe it will take something amazing and turn it into trash. The medical system is sexist, it's racist, it abuses people, it uses people's bodies for experiments, and there have already been atrocious adverse outcomes in clinical trials from some of the organizations that we trust the most, like Johns Hopkins, where I learned how to help people, and MAPS. In my opinion, there are major issues of consent, ethics, accountability, and boundaries, plus the same problems we have seen in spiritual communities of cult-like obedience to authority figures. This is not the way forward. This is the old story of the patriarchs that is already over. And in case the words aren't your kind of cup of tea, here's a little cartoon. If any of you recognize the person who originally drew this, don't say anything because they don't want to be known as associated with psychedelics. They allowed me and my friend Rachel to kind of adapt their artwork. This was originally a cartoon about mindfulness and it was kind of a joke about 10 minutes of mindfulness versus three hours. And so we kind of adapted it to um, psychedelics. And this word that my friend and I came up with at the same moment was corporadelics. And so what we see now is a lot of wide-eyed entrepreneurs and investors and people with a lot of wealth and power and access um, trying to kind of commodify something that's already perfect. Like nature has already perfected the delivery system. It's cheap, it's easily accessible, it's very easy to grow your own mushrooms. Uh, they're the safest thing you can put in your body, even safer than caffeine. And our system is telling these people that what they need to do is make a profit in order to give it to the world, when really all we need to do is teach people a couple basic things, it's not rocket science, and then help them take care of each other as they explore something that's already readily available. And so, I'd like to end with actually um, a chant. Uh, I don't know how to sing this chant, so I'm just gonna have to say it, unfortunately, but the real medicine of a lot of the psychedelic work, especially the shamanic work, is not in the drug. And I think that's mostly where a lot of us go wrong in our culture is misunderstanding that psychedelics aren't about taking psychedelics. They're about the whole container around psychedelic uh, use, the ritual, the songs, the music, the prayers, and the community. And so Maria was um, an amazing poet and a... Um, a kind of a trickster singer when she would help heal people. I am a woman who looks into the inside of things, says. I am the woman of light, says. I am the morning star woman, says. I am the God star woman, says. I am the woman of the great expanse of the water, says. Because I can go up to heaven, says because I can go over the expanse of the divine sea, says. Calmly, says. Without mishap, says. With sap, says. With dew, says. Thank you. Mm -hmm.